Nelifer Pazira is a journalist and actress, author and goodwill ambassador, a human rights activist who spent her formative years in Afghanistan, 10 of them under Soviet occupation. She has made startling documentaries about the plight of women in war-torn countries. Her last one was Return to Kandahar. Her new film, which she directs and acts in, is called Act of Dishonor. It's not a documentary. It is my pleasure to welcome Nelifer Pazira to Studio 4 to tell us more. Nice to see you again. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Take me back to your youth, uh, living in Afghanistan, under Soviet occupation. Growing in a police state, um, sleeping with rockets, sounds of rocket fires, waking up in the morning quite incredibly, going mm. to school. Not, I, I'm now I think about it and I say, why were we actually going to school? Mm -hmm. You know, not knowing what was the future like. Uh, father, doctor? My, yes, my dad was a physician, but of course he was put in prison for not agreeing with the government views. So I grew up as a child watching him in a detention center. And I think that kind of ingrained the seeds of that idea mm. of resisting and dislike of authority in me. Sure. And um, then came to a point where we had to escape. We just couldn't continue to live under those circumstances and not to forget that, of course, it's in the middle of the war. Uh, Escape to Pakistan? We did. We walked over for 12 days it took us to cross the country. It's a 500 kilometers journey by road, but we had to go through all kinds of diverted roads so we will not be caught mm. by the government authorities. Mm -hmm. um, they were stopping people from escaping or they were trying to, and we had to kind of um, um, make ourselves look like villagers so we won't be seen as city people got to Pakistan, and at that time, all we wanted was to get out of the country. We weren't really thinking about what the future is gonna be like, but just getting out of the war mm. and the police state. Yes. Um, and then lived in Pakistan as a refugee for a year before coming to Canada. Who helped you get out of Pakistan? Well, Canadian Embassy, I guess, because there were the sponsorship programs. And my dad was a political refugee, so uh, mm -hmm. um, so that brought us to, uh, fortunately for us, because millions of others just you know, yes. stayed there and then uh, they had had to go back and forth between many, many other atrocities, of course, that unfolded in Afghanistan, including the Taliban. And as a female, what kind of culture shock did you go through when you arrived in Canada? Well, I still have to go back and sort of write about that part of my life, um, which is, um, it was the immediate sense was learn the language, um, get out there and try to figure out the system, and be part of it. But of course, the cultural shock was enormous. Um, mm. Although I grew up in for a the city, whole family, for the whole I'm family, sure. but also for me, I was 17 going into 18. So being at that age um, and uh, carrying a burden in a way of a war from back home, um, something that people weren't really fully understanding where we came to live in Canada. It was un mm -hmm. unknown to people what was happening in Afghanistan back then. Yes, and as a w female, did you feel a degree of freedom? Or did it take a while? Because you knew what was going on in Afghanistan, especially with women. Oh, no, I mean, it was immediate. You could, uh, even coming to Pakistan, which is still was a very, very difficult place mm. for us to be, um, I couldn't go out without a male member. Even in Pakistan, we were not living in Afghanistan anymore, but the same kind of rules applied uh, even there um, within the, uh, the community that we were living. So coming to Canada, of course, being able to get out at night, there was no curfew. Right. As a woman, you could be out at night mm -hmm. and you feel safe. Uh, that's not something you do even to this day inside Afghanistan. Those were the days when my mother talks about how they used to go to night movies, you know, in the 1970s back in Afghanistan. But that's before the war. But ever since I grew up in that country, as a woman, you can never be out at mm -hmm. night by yourself. It's not safe. Right. Um, not culturally acceptable to some extent as well. So coming to Canada and, and feeling that sense of peace and freedom, um, and then kind of going, wow, this is fortunate. Mm -hmm. It's a strange, but it's fortunate. What made you want to tell the story of, of the women in Afghanistan? Uh, the first time when you did Kandahar, returned, and then returned to Kandahar, and now this one? Uh, because I think it's one of those stories that is not being told. And also, whenever I, I spend a lot of time in Afghanistan, I go back and forth. I spend my time you know, in women's quarters. Um, I go with them, they cook, we stay together, we, we talk. They tell me their stories, and oftentimes, I hear from them saying to me, you tell other people how it, how it is like for us. Mm -hmm. So it's almost a kind of a responsibility because now I have the means, I have the language, um, I am between the two cultures, 
And I feel responsible. I feel that these are, you know, women of Afghanistan are misjudged often. Um, they're not understood that they are, you know, individuals and characters, and they deserve to live a better life. Yes. You know, that's just the bottom line. It's just bottom the basic, line. yeah. So, uh, Act of Dishonor, this film, not a documentary, not necessarily all fiction. Tell me about it. Who inspired it? What inspired it? How did it begin? Well, it started off with um, my own sort of recollections of memories of working in Afghanistan, where we were filming in various occasions. We'll have young women would be interested to participate, but with the difficulty they were faced with, their fathers would not allow them to go on the film set. It's not considered as a morally good thing for a woman to be on camera. Would that be in, in all families? Or well, just most very traditional families? We're talking about a large segment of the population, you know. Mm. Um, um, it's, it's still a taboo for a lot of women who are getting out there and going on camera. They're taking a risk to their lives every day, not only because of the family, but also culturally. There are a lot of people who are very conservative, not to forget the Taliban as well, that they are under that kind of a threat. Um, we have far more TV presenters now who are women, but they can't go on camera without a scarf. Um, and uh, a lot of them are taking that risk. Um, so to be on a film as well is not considered as a piece of art, but something immoral by some parts of mm. the country and society. And we're talking about 85% of the country's ruler. We're not talking about the city centers, where maybe it's a little bit slightly different situation, but the rest of the country. So um, encountering the situation where we would have young women interested and excited and wanted to go and you know be in front of the camera or see what it is like, or even be photographed, mm -hmm. but pressures from family, from community, and fear of being judged uh, for being immoral. Um, so that has started it. And then I discovered a friend of mine was making a film in Kabul, and it was a short film. He had a middle-aged woman who was actually in the film as a member of the cast. Her husband was in Pakistan at the time, and this is, I think, in 2003 now. And um, they spent six days shooting, and they finished the film, uh, just shooting part of it. She went back home and her husband had returned from Pakistan and all the neighbors had started to say that a strange man came and took her away. She was always dressed up and leaving every morning when you're not around and he killed her. And it's that's shocking to us. It's hard for her us to believe it. Her husband killed her, killed her because, because she, was she was out on a film set with a known man, mm -hmm. with a strange man. And that, of course, is scarred, you know, the film and the film crew and the filmmaker. And when I heard the story, I kept saying to myself, it sounds so bizarre and strange, but we always say facts is stranger than fiction. Yes. It is real, it's true, so I want to make a film. And the film is not based exactly on her story because the character in my film is a young girl. But it's still to try to bring some of those themes into um, you know, into the film and kind of yes. open it up for discussion, you know. Would that be considered an honor killing, that kind of killing? It is, it's an a crime of honor. An act of outrage, honor. yes. But is that an honor killing? It is. Why was he dishonored? Let's start there. Okay, because for uh, in most societies, and Afghanistan is not, not an exception when it comes to issues of crimes of honor, um, a lot of traditional societies place emphasis on the name and the good name of the family, and man is seen as the protector of the honor of that family, the name of that family. It goes down through generations. So if you're a man, you're under enormous pressure as well mm -hmm. to preserve and protect that. Okay, if you're a tough guy and you can go out and do things, good for you. But if you're not, how do you deal with it? Right. You know, so this is why. And a woman who leaves the house without the permission of her husband or male family member, if it's a traditional setting, and then if she shows up in public with other people or she disappears for a period of time or hours and nobody knows where she is, that is considered dishonoring the name of the family. Mm -hmm. And to correct it, one way is to try to get rid of her because that way the man has proven that he's actually now restored the good honor and the right. name of the family. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's so far from honor as we know it, as you know. Well, that's the most dishonorable thing to do in my view, to try mm -hmm. to, um, you know, any acts of violence, be it against women and men, is not you know, honorable, but in the context of cultures, 
Um, that's how it's seen and preserved. And it's not a strange, you know, Western societies also have a sense. And I think it comes from the issue of being shamed, you know, the fear of being judged, being left out, especially when you survive in a community that you rely on everybody else. It's, it's the mm -hmm. communal aspect of it. Um, and you want to just carry on living based on those, you know, etiquettes that the community has prescribed sure. for you. Yeah, the patriarchal a aspect of it, uh, and as, as you know so well here, if uh, a, a Canadian man is married to a woman uh, who is in film, he's proud of that most often. Yes. It's, it's not life-threatening. No. Is my point. It's not, exactly. But in some other societies it isn't, and I think Afghanistan, unfortunately, really lags behind because mm. we do not have a, a very vibrant cinema. We didn't have a much history of it to begin right. with. It's a new phenomena, and it's always associated with Western promiscuity yes. and the values and morals of, you know, placed on women and how that should be controlled. And in that sense, it's not very different from any other patriarchal society in history where man wants to maintain its degree mm -hmm. of dominance over a woman. Mm -hmm. When we come back, uh, we'll talk more about the making of the film. That must have been very interesting. <laughs> uh, Nellifer Pazira, our guest, she is an actor, she's a filmmaker and a humanitarian. <laughs> 